couple of months ago, I created an interactive texture painter for the game I'm developing in order to simulate liquid interacting with a given environment's materials. Just recently, while brainstorming some additional game mechanics and features, I realized that I would need to make some improvements to this texture painting system. With the improvements, we can easily paint high-resolution render textures in the ballpark of 4096 pixels squared, and feed that texture data into shaders that can then interpret it properly, with CPU involvement only necessary when getting texture data for user or AI interaction. This allows me to meet my goal of using this texture painting system for many different applications throughout a whole lot more of the game. Before getting to that though, a quick recap of the pre-existing system and some of its limitations. Here, edits are prompted by particle collisions. Our texture data is set by the CPU and then sent to the GPU where it's mapped to a secondary Atlas UV map. This obviously limits how often we can modify the textures, the complexity of that modification, and the resolution. The performance, while totally fine at lower resolutions, would unsurprisingly drop off pretty quickly for texture resolutions at higher powers of 2, and this would be the case with the simplest possible single color pixel manipulation. And this all worked just fine as a fully functional stopgap for level development because the system's modifications we'll be discussing here are focused more so on the semantics rather than the functionality. With that in mind, we can move on to the redesign. The first change I made was to move the texture editing code over to the GPU through render textures. Instead of calculating pixel operations in the script and setting a texture 2D, I dispatch a compute shader whenever we want to make an edit, which then efficiently calculates our render texture's color data so that it can then be used by surface shaders. The performance boost from the compute shaders then allows for a lot more complex pixel operations, which is exactly what I needed to add support for different liquid types. So now would be a good time to get into what's going on inside the compute shader. Rather than simply setting the alpha value of a texture, the shader efficiently interpolates the color of regions of pixels based on radius and falloff values for any given point. For instance, in a singular edit, this color value is lerped between the pre-existing color and the new color, the weight of which is determined by the edit size divided by the distance of the pixel from the center of the edit point. Because of this new color information contained in the texture, I needed to tweak the surface shader to properly use the new information. Here, rather than just lerping color values based on the alpha of each pixel in the received texture, we can now use a logic operation to decide where to draw the received color overlay values. For each pixel, we're only drawing the overlay if the square of its alpha is greater than 0.5. When taking falloff into consideration, this means that we can get a realistic buildup effect as the gradient of the falloff increases in opacity. At this point, I was also able to make some smaller graphical tweaks, which includes reducing the amount of texture warping going on in order to better see the high resolution textures details. So that just about wraps up how we're blending this render texture. With this new color system in place, I set up some global color values just for the sake of gameplay consistency. These will then be accessed by game objects that might want to use them for painting. The green and blue color values that you can see here will be used to represent the familiar corrosive acid and spilled soda. I also wrote up an additional surface shader for physics props. This one is a whole lot simpler. If they make contact with particles, the shader will blend in a filth overlay, the color of which is interpolated between the last particle and any pre-existing colors if it's already dirty. You can see here how much this improves the appearance of objects when they're being destroyed by the acid, or if they're just in its general vicinity. So at this point, the shader functionality is, well, functional. So. Let's head on back to the CPU side of things again, and we'll start by fixing this little problem. What you're seeing are liquid particles that aren't sending the right information to the compute shader for editing. Specifically, the falloff value isn't being set properly, so I ended up modifying this and adding in enhanced control on a particle emitter basis. Now, we can properly make tiny little edits to this texture, which 
in combination with color control, completes the basis for the extended mechanics that I had planned. Due to the pretty fundamental change in how we're now writing this texture data, I had to set up a way to get it off of the GPU so that we could use it for gameplay interaction. I found that this could be done pretty efficiently by reading a single pixel at a given coordinate at a time. The color of this pixel determines how an object is affected. For instance, the tanks on the player's mop will have an amount of liquid added for any color with an alpha above 0.5, and breakable objects and small bots will end up taking damage for any value that's close to the global acid color. With this fully set up, the gameplay integration is mostly completed, as now we can performantly get and set pixels on these large atlas textures. The high resolution here allows for precision editing, in addition to more complex pixel operations, adding support for more potential colors and even liquid buildup. Add this to the extended game mechanics, and it creates a much more reactive environment which is a lot more engaging for the player. And that just about concludes our development log, but first, if you'd like to see more content in the future, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Thanks for watching.